Let's look at a slightly more complex example, this time dealing with families. So here's an experiment. Imagine that a family is known to have three children. Begin by making the appropriate assumptions for the probability space. Pause for a minute and see if you can construct the sample space. Let's begin. The sample space, well, if there are three children, they are each characterized by their gender, boy or girl. So the sample space can be enumerated by listing all possible sequences of boys and girls, a little b for boy, g for girl, listed, say, in order of age, oldest first, youngest last. And therefore, the sample space consists of the triple b, 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 three boys, or b, b, g, the youngest is a girl, or b, g, b, the middle child is a girl, the others are boys, and so on, with g, 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 meaning all three children are girls. And there are exactly eight possibilities. Let's put together some events here. All right. So, these connote nothing of particular interest, except they're, they're crafted together to make a point. So let A be the event that the family has at most one girl. What is this event? What subset of sample points is referred to by this event? Well, if it's at most one girl, then you can have at most one G appearing in the string of three letters. And therefore, you have four possibilities. No girls and exactly one girl in various locations, oldest, middle, or youngest. Let's look at another event. Let B be the event. The family has children of both sexes. This means that the bookend sample points, three boys, three girls, are eschewed, are eliminated. And what remains leaves you six sample points where all those triples contain at least one B and one J. It's easier in this setting to actually look at the complement of this event. What is B complement? That the family contains children of only one gender. And there are two possibilities there, all boys or all girls. Excellent. Now, let's put together a probability measure. The natural probability measure is a combinatorial setting. It is uniform across the possibilities. And therefore, we look at an atomic measure, which puts mass 1 over 8 on each atom. Each triple of genders has got probability 1 in 8. And here is now our question. Are the events A and B independent? Pause and think about this. Don't start the analysis yet, but stare at the events. See if you can get some feeling for them. Does your gut tell you one way or the other? You, do you think they're independent? Do you think perhaps they're not independent? Pause and think about it for a bit before looking at the analysis to follow. Now, let's take a look at this. Let's begin by writing down the probability of A. Now, it's clear A has got four sample points, and therefore the chance in A is 4 and 8, or 1 and 2. Okay? But it's going to be useful to decompose this using additivity as follows. We can partition A into two events. An event where there are no girls. Well, this is an atom, a singleton consisting of just a triple B, B, B. And the event that there is precisely one girl. This gives you an event with three elements in it, where the girl is either the oldest or the middle or the youngest. And additivity tells us the possibilities are going to add. There's one for the first possibility, three for the next, and therefore there's a one, in th one plus three or four possibilities which trigger the event A. Okay, we find that A has got a chance exactly one and two. Okay, so far so good. What about the event B? Well, it is easier to look at the complement of B where the children are all of one gender. There are two possibilities for the children of being of one gender, all boys or all girls. Out of eight, therefore, there's a one in four chance that the complement of the event B occurs, and therefore, by additivity, the chance of B occurring is one minus one in four, or three in four. 
Well, for independence, I'm going to need to check the joint probability of A and B. What can I say about the probability of the intersection of A with B? What does A intersection B mean? Well, it means that the family has at most one girl and that the family has children of both sexes. But this means that the family has precisely one girl. And that girl could be either the oldest, the middle, or the youngest. The event A intersection B consists of the triple GBB, BGB, and BBG. It's got three possibilities. The probability of this event, therefore, is naturally 3 in 8. But here is the nub. We, 3 in 8 is decomposed as 1 in 2 times 3 in 4 which is the same as the probability of A times the probability of B. And perhaps a little more unexpe unexpectedly now, a rule of products has emerged from the rubble. And we conclude by definition that the events A and B are indeed independent. Did this fit with your intuitive idea for the problem? If it did, then you had good intuition. If it didn't, then this is going to help you refine the intuition. Now, having done this work, admittedly not too much work, naturally enough we want to see if we can expand on this and apply it more generally. Uh, how could we generalize this problem? Well, naturally enough, we can replace three children by, let us say, n children. Why n? Well, it is inevitable that I call the algebraic variable anything else, isn't it? So suppose the family has n children, and define the events A and B just as, as, as given here. That A is the event that the family has at most one girl, B the event that the family has children of both sexes. Are A and B independent? Well, naturally, from this example, I would be tempted to say, yeah, sure, of course. It makes clear that, in fact, they are independent, though the structure looks a little more complex now. But we should be a little cautious. So let's go ahead and run an analysis through one more time, this time for a family with n children. So a family is known to have n children. The sample space now is a system of n tuples of genders, where each element is a boy or a girl, B or a J. How many n tuples are there? Well, if there are just two children, there are four possibilities, BB, BG, JB, GJ. When there are three children, as we saw, there are eight possibilities. Four children give you 16 possibilities. And in general, with n children, there are two to the power n possibilities for the distribution of genders across those n children. The events A and B are as advertised, but the combinatorial measure now we have is an equal mass to each sample point, to each atom, and therefore the probability of each atom is 1 in 2 to the power n. The question again is, are A and B independent? And let's run through the calculations again. First, what can I say about the probability of A? Again, it is natural to decompose A, partition it into two pieces. An event, a singleton, consisting of all boys and no girls. And an event consisting of precisely one girl. Now, if there's precisely one girl, that girl by age could be in any one of n locations. And therefore, the probability of the second event is going to be n over 2 to the n. Additivity gives, brings home everything else. So the probability of A is 1 plus n over 2 to the n. All right, what about B? Well, again, let's start with B complement, because that's simple. In this setting again, B complement means there are children of only one gender, which means all boys or all girls, and there are no other possibilities. And therefore, the probability of B complement is simply 2 in 2 to the power n. Cancel out a 2 in numerator and denominator. It's 1 in 2 to the power n minus 1. What about the probability of B? Well, additivity right to the rescue. It's 1 minus the reciprocal of 2 to the power n minus 1. Excellent. We now still need to say something about the probability of the intersection. What does A intersection B mean? It means that the family has at most one girl and children of both sexes. 
In words, that means the family has exactly one girl. But that one girl, as we've seen, can be in any one of n age locations. And therefore, the probability of A intersection B is n over 2 to the power n. Notice how, once you've understood a small version of a problem, frequently the mode of thought informs generalizations, abstractions. Well, at this point, we've got all the data we need. Our question is, are A and B independent? Now, if they are to be independent, then we need a rule of products. So we have to check a rule of products. Is the probability of A intersection B equal to the probability of A times the probability of B? The first step, write down the probability of A intersection B on the left, the probability of A times the probability of B on the right, and we're asking, is this identity true? Let's simplify. Okay, at this point, we just, we've exhausted all the probabilistic chance-driven connotation. It's now just purely algebra. Cancel out a factor 2 to the power n in the, new, in the denominator on both sides. Take the 1 plus n and multiply it out inside the round brackets. And we ask, is n equal to 1 plus n minus 1 plus n over 2 to the power n minus 1? A little more uh, massaging. Cancel n on both sides. Move the n over 2 to the power n minus 1 to the left. And you ask, is n over 2 to the power n minus 1 equal to 1? And therefore, this is equal to asking the following question. Is it true that 2 to the power n minus 1 is equal to 1 plus n? And we immediately say that we have a problem. On the left, we have something which is growing exponentially fast with n. On the right, we have something which is trudging along very pedestrian, linearly with n. Clearly, this cannot hold all the time. And in fact, it doesn't. Here is a table giving you examples of small values of n to see what happens to 1 plus n and 2 to the n minus 1. 1 plus n grows linearly. As n runs from 2 through 6, 1 plus n runs from 3 to 7. But 2 to the n minus 1 runs 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. It's blowing up very fast. When you look at this table, you find there's exactly one row where the second and third columns are the same. And that is when n is equal to 3. We conclude that a and B are independent if and only if the family has three children. This might be a little surprising at first blush. Among other things, this points out the danger of jumping to general conclusions based on limited empirical evidence. Right? The case n equal to 3 was special. Yes, I did this intentionally. I do not apologize, right? I gave you one special case, and of course we were tempted to believe that that was typical, but it was not. It was atypical. In fact, that is the only case where independence erupts. All other values for n result in non-independence, in dependent events. We could dig a little more into this and say, well, do I really feel, understand this? Do I believe this? Well. Take a look at what happens, for example, if n is large. Right? Think of a, your favorite large number. Now, if n is large and you're told, for example, that the family has at most one girl. Suppose you're given that information. In other words, you're given that A occurs. Now, if A occurs, there's one possibility in A which corresponds to no girl. And n possibilities where n is big for exactly one girl. If A occurs, the overwhelming possibility is that one of the end possibilities with one girl is what really happened as the outcome. And therefore, the chance of B given A is actually very high. Now, after the fact, of course, it becomes clear, it becomes transparent. We understand why these events influence potentially each other. But this kind of analysis doesn't expose the fact that with N equal to 3, they actually don't influence each other's chances. That needed calculation. And this is why the abstraction and the definition are useful and important. So, the model so far, the idea so far, is that independence is governed by a multiplication table. Independence is at heart a rule of products. If you want to check independence, you need to verify that a product identity holds true.
Our next step is to take a look at the definition itself and look at a variation on that theme to expose flavors that were not immediately apparent at first blush.